Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. We've made it to the final chapter of 1 John. We won't get through the entire chapter this morning, but my goal is to get through, as Chuck read, through uh, verse 12. C.S. Lewis, a great English Christian writer, philosopher, and apologist of the early and middle 20th century, while speaking on the radio, the BBC radio one day, um, created one of the greatest arguments for who Jesus is. It's called Lewis's Trilemma. He then codified that statement in his book, Mere Christianity. I quote, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the, re- the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the th- sort of things Jesus uh, said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of a man who says he is a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a man, madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit on him and kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that option open to us. He did not intend to. Now it seems to me, it seems to be, to me obvious that he was neither a lunatic nor a fiend. And consequently, however, strange or testifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. Quote from C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity. The topic of our message this morning is a love proven. Of course, we're in this series of 1 John that you may know, the light of the world, a love proven. Lord lunatic or liar Jesus is one of these as C.S. Lewis so eloquently wrote I'm not a big C.S. Lewis fan I find him hard to read but a number of folks around here are and when I read Mere Christianity a number of years ago this quote really impressed me and I've seen Lewis's trilemma stated in multiple ways uh, in multiple times. Jesus is one of these. No being can say and do the things he did without fitting into one of these categories. The Apostle John, nearing the end of his ministry as he's teaching in Ephesus, 30 years or so after all the other apostles were, had been executed, he's still leading the first century church. And he's dealing with this growing movement that we now refer to as Gnosticism. He's dealing with these false teachers that are beginning to infiltrate the church. And these false teachers in Ephesus and in other places were teaching that Jesus was not God. Or that Jesus was not the Son of God. Teachers like Sertius who taught that Jesus was actually a spirit that descended on a man, sort of like demon possession. That occurred at Jesus' baptism, according to Sertius, but then left him before he was crucified. I would argue then that if that was true, we we could not have been saved because a sufficient sacrifice was not made on our behalf. John was dealing with these issues in the early church, which caused him to repeatedly go back to who Jesus is 
and what's different about Jesus and what Jesus causes us to do. So let's dig into the text this morning and see what God has for us there. I remind you that as we read and study the text, allow God through the Holy Spirit to speak to you and move you. Allow the text to move your place in the world. Allow you to experience God as you relate to him through what he says. You see, God's word is one half of our communication with God. He communicates to us through the Holy Spirit and through his word. We communicate back to him through our worship and through our prayer. So commune with God in the study of his word. As we dig into it this morning, John chapter, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. Everyone, no, chapter 5, verse 1. I'm dyslexic. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. John here reiterates one of the tests of the people of the church. You remember that we've been studying, looking at that, as John said, you've got to test every spirit. One of the tests is, do you believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that he was born of God? He's going over territory that he's repeatedly gone over. To be part of the family of God, we have to believe that Jesus is the one set apart by God to be the Savior of the world. You have to believe that Jesus is part of the triune Godhead, in, eternally engaged in a relationship with the Father and the Holy Spirit. We have to understand the Trinity, the triune Godhead, existing eternally as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, co-equal members of the triune God making up one God. Three individuals together joined for eternity. In order to be part of the family of God, you have to believe that Jesus was one of the eternal members of the triune Godhead. A relationship that reflects Jesus while being co-equal with the Father and the Holy Spirit serves the Father by following the Father's plan perfectly. The Father's plan was before the foundation of the earth to call us to be His children. The Father's plan was to put Adam and Eve in the garden, perfect, sinless, with everything they needed. The Father's plan was for them to sin. He knew they would, and they didn't fail. We know that because God chose us to be his, his children to save us by Jesus dying on the cross before he set the plan in motion. And Jesus carried out that plan perfectly. As Chuck talked about, the night before he was crucified, the, the thought, not just of the nails going through his hands, not just the, the thought of the whip on his back, not just the thought of the thorn scraping down on his skull, but the thought of that eternal Godhead being fractured. The thought of hanging on the cross and saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As every bit of our sin, he becomes. The thought of that fracture caused him such tremendous pain all part of God's plan. He carried it out. Praying next to the, to the olive tree in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, Father, may this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. He came subservient to the plan of the Father. John also reminds us and his readers that the Christian loves both the Father and the one who sent the Father. The Father and the Son are a package deal. You don't get to choose one and, re and neglect the other. To really love one, we have to love the other. Jesus said, everyone who believes, or I'm sorry, John wrote, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves him who has been born of him. They're a package deal. He goes on in verse 2. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commands. For this is the love of God, 
that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. John uh, kind of flips things over in, uh, in these verses. We expect John to say that we demonstrate our love of God by loving other believers. But he flips it around and he says, you can demonstrate your love of God or your love of, of believers by your love of God. By this we know that the love, the children, that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. He flips the equation around for us. Love is central to our walk with God. You cannot remove love from the church. It's not the church if there's not love. We talked about it in Sunday school. Service, family, fellowship, koinonia. One of the, one of the words that, that the Greeks have for love, koinonia. It's part and parcel of what the church is and what the church does. I think John reverses the statement here to confirm that love is central to our walk with God. If we love God, we also love his people. And if we love his people, we love God. You can't really divorce the two. You have to love people in order to love God and you have to love God in order to love people. John adds to this at the end of verse 3 that the commandments are not burdensome. On the face of just reading that statement, most of, of us would be thinking, wait, God's commandments are burdensome. They're really hard. It's hard work to do what God tells us to do. It's hard to be involved in ministry. I was talking to Brian this week about ministry stuff, and I told him that ministry is pretty simple if people aren't involved. It'd be really easy to do this job if we didn't have to deal with people. But people make it a little bit more difficult. Now, let me rephrase that. People make it a lot more difficult. But that's what God has told us to do. People let you down. People don't do what they say they're going to do. It's hard work doing what God has commanded us to do. If you've not experienced the, the hard work in loving people, you're not loving enough. When I was a medic up in Indiana, we had a medical director that told us that if you don't kill a patient now and then, you're not seeing enough patients. In other words, you're going to kill some patients. It's just, I mean, it's just the law of averages tells you you're going to kill a patient or not. The same thing's true about, about ministry. If you've not struggled with people, it's because you've not really been involved in ministry. You're just going along to get along. You're not really accomplishing much. John doesn't mean here that being obedient to God is simple, is simple, is simple and easy. Impel is easy and simple to combine. I'm trying to shorten the space. John means that God's commandments are not crushing to us. They are not a weight we cannot bear. Sure, it's hard work, but God gives you the power to do it. God gives you the power to, to love others, even the unlovable, because he indwells you by the, uh, with the power of the Holy Spirit. God has given us a helper to accomplish his commands. We can't keep the commands of God without the power of the Holy Spirit. When we get the Father, we get the Son, we also get the Holy Spirit. He gives you the power to do what you can't do by yourself. He gives us the power to keep his commandments. And because he gives us the power to keep his commandments, they're not burdensome to us. They're not a weight you can't bear. You can accomplish the doing of them because you have the Holy Spirit. <coughs> he moves on to verse 4. For, <coughs> <coughs> For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. The question we need to ask in this verse is, what does John mean by overcome the world? The immediate context demands that we see John is talking about the deity of Jesus and the teaching of false teachers who deny that Jesus is God. We have victory over false teaching through our faith. 
in Greek, there's a word play going on here. The, the original Greek readers of, of this letter would have seen the play on words that John is, is uh, using here. And the Greek grammar is really tricky. But it appears that John is saying that in the past, the sinful world was overcome and conquered, which means that presently we have victory of sin through our faith. So what has occurred in the past to give us victory? Well, there's a number of things in the context here. The plan of God is in the past. The fulfillment of the plan by Jesus is in the past. It was 60 years or so in the past for John. It's 2,000 years in the past for us. Where Jesus died on the cross to provide you victory over sin. God sent Jesus to become a little dirty diapered baby, born of a virgin, the only God-man, 100% God and 100% man, to grow and eventually die a cruel death as he became sin for us in our place, was placed in a borrowed grave only to rise from the dead and come out of the grave victorious over sin and the sinful world. Jesus' death on the cross provides us with victory over sin through our faith. That's what John's talking about here. But now look at the other side of the equation. Overcoming sin. Overcoming the world only comes through those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Eternal life, victory of sin, over sin, only comes to those who accept the deity of Jesus. That Jesus is the God-man, 100% God, 100% man. You reject that and you reject your own salvation. If Jesus is not God, you are not saved. That's about as clear and easy as I can say it. If Sertius and the others, or Serinthus, I'm sorry, and others uh, of the Gnostics teaching in the, in the first century were correct, that Jesus is not God, we're not saved. We have no potential for salvation because you need the value of God to pay the price for us all. But you need a man to pay the penalty for man. The blood of a goat wouldn't do. So it had to be a God man. Not 50% God, 50% man. 100% God, 100% man. And only Jesus fills that. You reject that and you reject your own salvation. It goes back to the question of lunatic, liar, or Lord. What was Jesus? Was he a lunatic? Was he a liar? Or is he the Lord? That's a question we have to answer. That's a question that has to be answered in order for there to be salvation. But now John goes a little deeper and, and more difficult to understand. Look at verse 6. This is he who came, who came by water and by blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. If you don't have to read this verse uh, through several times to understand it, you're a much better scholar than I am. If you get this verse the first time, you're doing really good. This is a complex verse. Let's see if we can't walk through it. The difficulty in this verse comes from John's use of the word, he who came by water and by blood. What exactly is John referring to in water and blood? There are three possible ways to view this statement. I found that the New American Commentary of 1 John articulates these three views the best. So let me read this section of the New American Commentary to you. The water and the blood refer to baptism, water, and the Lord's blood, or Lord's Supper, blood. This interpretation, which goes back to the time of reformers, is not without its difficulty. First, John is concerned with combating false teachers who denied human nature of Jesus. It's therefore unlikely that John would now switch topics. 
Second, John uses the past tense, the one who came, which reflects a pa the past completed event in history, whereas baptism and the Lord's Supper are recurring observances. Third, although water seems to be likely synonym for baptism, the same is not true for the Lord's Supper. So we can take water and blood, meaning baptism and the Lord's Supper, off the table. That doesn't make sense. The second um, explanation is the water and the blood are parallel to John 19, 34 through 35, which speaks of a spear being thrust into Jesus' side at the crucifixion and produced water and blood. Although this view can be found as far back as Augustine, it remains problematic. The first, the order has been reversed. First John speaks of water and of blood, but the Gospel of John reads blood and water. Second, if the water and blood refer to the spear thrust, then how can it be said that Jesus came by them? Whereas the Gospel of John indicates that the blood and water came from Jesus. Here it is said that Jesus came by the water and blood. This view does not account for the statements in verse 8 that affirms that Jesus did not come by water and blood only. Or come by water only, but by water and blood. So the, that view has problems. The third view the water and blood refers to the terminal points in Jesus' earthly ministry. His baptism, water, and his crucifixion, blood. This is the best interpretation and is followed by most scholars. Historically, Jesus came into the power by the water of his baptism, and even more so by the blood of the cross. Unlike the previous two views, this explanation fits the historical context of John's epistle. John writes this letter to counter the Gnostic tendencies of the false teachers. These false teachers, who at one time were part of the fellowship, as in 2.19, were denying the hum humanity of Jesus, and so John emphasizes the reality of the Incarnation. John's further qualifications that J Jesus came not by water only, but by water and blood, is likely a direct renunciation of false teaching, perhaps that of Serinthus, that claimed that Jesus was born an ordinary man, being an ordinary human being, but became God's special agent when the heavenly Christ descended upon him at his baptism. The heavenly Christ abandoned him before his death, and consequently, it was only the earthly Jesus who died on the cross. In seeking to refute this teaching, John emphasizes that it was Jesus who experienced both baptism and crucifixion. So let me boil all of that down. I wanted you to have the, the, the scholarly information there so you can boil this down. Jesus' earthly ministry is bookend, bookended by his baptism and his crucifixion. So Jesus, walking along by the river Jordan, sees John the baptizer, and John the baptizer says, look, there's the Messiah. And he gets baptized by John in the river. And the dove descends down, and the thundering voice, voice says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. We have the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Fast forward to the end of his ministry. Jesus is hanging on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Into my hands I commit myself. Jesus, end of his ministry. Baptism, water, cross, blood. John says, this is he who came by water and by blood. This is he who was, who was demonstrated who was shown, was seen by his baptism and by his crucifixion. Jesus Christ, not by the water only. He didn't just get baptized, but by the water and the blood. He came to die. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. If we don't believe that both of these are pictures of Jesus, the Son of God, very God himself, and very man himself, who suffered and died, we are not of God ourselves. But John does not finish there. He continues on. There's also a sense here that John is referring to the Jewish idea that the Messiah would be conquering hero, king, and not a suffering servant. Look again in verse 6. Jesus came by water and blood, not just water only. Water only would have been his baptism only, no death. His messianic career beginning at his baptism, but no death on the cross. 
that wouldn't be the Messiah. That's what the Jews expected. But God's plan always included Jesus on the cross. John continues that the Spirit testifies. Because the Spirit is the truth. The Holy Spirit, part of the triune Godhead, eternally co-equal with the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit can only testify that Jesus is God because it's the truth. And the Holy Spirit is truth. The word testify, as we've seen previously, is from the root word from where we get martyr. It means that the Holy Spirit stands up and validates the facts. He authenticates what has been said. The Holy Spirit authenticates at baptism and at crucifixion who Jesus is, the Messiah, our Savior. Go on to verse 7. Maybe. For the, there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree. John says that the Holy Spirit, Jesus' baptism and Jesus' crucifixion all convey the same point. The truth of who Jesus was and who Jesus is. John then makes a great point in the argument. If we can accept the testimony of men, we should be all over the testimony of God since God's testimony is far greater. If you can, I swear to affirm or tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. If we can accept when somebody does that, how can we not accept what God says? And God says, Jesus is my son who I sent to save you. God, through the baptism of Jesus, through the crucifixion of Jesus, through the work of the Holy Spirit, has told the world who Jesus is and that he came here to save us. God has validated Jesus and his work. Verse 10. If we receive the... Te Verse 10. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his son. We're back to that binary choice that we've been talking about. Either we believe God through his plan provided his son Jesus to suffer and die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, or we say God's lying. You either believe it or you call God a liar. That's the binary choice you have. There's no middle ground. In the case of Jesus and his own claims, he's either a lunatic, a liar, or he's actually the Lord. The result of believing God's testimony is we're saved, and God the Father, through God the Holy Spirit, provides us assurance of our salvation. As believers in God and with the salvation he provides us, we're able to view the historical narrative and see God working through the historical narrative to accomplish what God wants us to know. That He saved us. That He loves us. And that He called us to be His children. The world can't do that because they don't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. They don't understand because God hasn't yet moved their heart. One to the last two verses. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son of life, or a Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. John concludes this pericope by going back to where he started. If you believe that Jesus is God, and as the God-man suffered and died to pay the penalty of sin, rose from the dead and is reunited with the Father, then you have eternal life. If you do not, then you do not have eternal life. It's that simple. Now, believe is a, an interesting word. What does John mean here by saying believe? He's telling us we have to act upon it. We have to, we have to be committed to it. We have to have faith in it. Oh, by the way, Jesus gives you that faith. So you can't not believe when he's called you. It's the way it works. So what's the conclusion here? What do we... What do we do with all this? God has provided us some tremendous evidence. Most historians, even non-biblical seeking historians, non-Christians, would agree 
that there is an historical figure called Jesus of Nazareth. The, the evidence is conclusive. There was somebody walking around, around Israel in about 30 AD who called, whose name was Jesus who ultimately died a, a horrible death on the cross. The, the evidence for that is irrefutable. God has provided us clear indication. Jesus is there or was there. Now God has gone further and said that not only was he there, but he died on the cross. He's my son. He's actually God and man. He provides us that evidence in his text. And so we have to make that choice. With the things that Jesus said, do we see him as a lunatic? As uh, C.S. Lewis would say, somebody akin to somebody who calls themselves a poached egg? Or was he just lying? If Jesus really meant it, he's a lunatic. If he didn't mean it, he's lying. Or he actually is Lord. The evidence is clear. There was a guy named Jesus who did these things and said these things. We have really good evidence that what Jesus said we have recorded in the text. We have more evidence of that than we do of Plato and so forth. So we believe that the guy that historically is accurate to walk around said these things. What do we do with what he said? I am God. I came to fulfill God's plan. That is to save you. And that is to provide you a path for eternal life. We have to view that. We have to decide, is it true or not? Is he lunatic, liar, or Lord? The Holy Spirit indwells you and gives you the ability to know that as a follower of Jesus. He indwells you and confirms internally to you that you are his and that you're saved. You then demonstrate your salvation by how you love each other and how you love him. That's the reality of this. Jesus died for you. God called you first. Jesus died for you. Then the Holy Spirit drew you to him. And now the Holy Spirit confirms to you that you are his eternally. There can be nothing better in life than that truth. Father, thank you for the truth of what you tell us in your word. That you called us to be your children before the foundation of the, or, of the earth. That you drew us to you. That you sent Jesus to die on the cross. That Jesus, the only God-man, died on the cross. Suffered and died. Paid the price. Rose again. Sits at the right hand of you now. And provides us eternal life. You've then given us the Holy Spirit to draw us to you. And the Holy Spirit confirms within our souls today the reality of our, our eternal life. Father, give us the burden for those around us, for the burden of the people that we see at work and in our communities and even some in our homes that need you. Give us the burden for them that we can reach out and gather them as well. Thank you, Father, for this group of believers, this group of people that love you and love to study your word. Thank you for joining us on your pages of your text to let us experience you and fellowship with you as we study it. We love you and we want to serve you in Jesus' name. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.